I loved physics. There are many, many, many unanswered questions. Compete only with yourself. Welcome to Scientifically Yours. I'm Gohar Raza and you are watching Scientifically Yours, a program dedicated to outstanding women scientists who have contributed to expand the horizon of science, who have excelled. And today, we are very fortunate that we have with us Professor Rupa Manjari Kosh. If I begin by telling you a story of a girl who was restless, who was born in a family of writers, his father was interested in music and the whole family was interested in music and had nothing to do with science and yet excelled in science. Will it be your story? Similar, almost identical, you caught it right. Yes, uh, nobody in my immediate family uh, was in science, but I think uh, I imbibed the sense of logic, uh, the, the value of life, uh, everything that you need probably for a later career in physics. It was seeded in that very humanities oriented family uh, of mine. Your father was a communist yes. and he was a part of that whole movement, uh, how did it, uh, it shape your life as well as way of looking at society, humanity and the entire nature? Yeah, I mean I was born in Calcutta. Calcutta those days if you know, you cannot live an insular life. I think it helped that my father was whatever, I didn't know that he was a communist, he believed in socialism or whatever later on, but I was an avid reader. Our house was full of books. And uh, I read everything. I was a third child uh, of uh, my parents, and so almost left to myself. Uh, I could finish a book starting in the morning by evening, and if something is interesting and fat, I would stay up all night and read. And I was more or less engrossed in my own world. I read through all his collection much later of Marx. I don't know how many people have read the entire volumes of Tagore, the entire volumes of Nazrul, the entire volumes of everybody almost that I could lay my hands on. So being a third child helped you? Oh, immensely. <laughs> I, uh, there are many funny stories about the Elders me. left you <laughs> to, to your cozy corners. Yes, well, I, I was involved but not quite in everything. And what, how it helped was that when you are the youngest, you learn a lot by hearing. So when my br sister and brother were struggling with their studies, I was in, always in the background, but I knew everything. So by the time it was my turn, uh, I didn't have to struggle to do the regular curriculum at all. And uh, the story goes that at three, when I was only three, I could do all the tables and somebody, they didn't know that I knew and uh, my grandmother's sister was visiting and they were talking about something and I blurted out uh, <laughs> pretty difficult <laughs> mathematics at that time. And they thought my brain was getting overtaxed and they removed all books from my reach when I was three, saying that you know, I didn't know how to read but I knew everything and it was too much for my brain. So there are stories like that but the rest of it was nice and my father and my mother, uh, they allowed us to be free. Uh, there are incidents that uh, you know, in a elder gathering of elders when they are debating something, I am a, a young child, I am listening and I give my comment which probably was an in inappropriate things to do and then somebody scolded me saying that don't stay here when the and my father from nowhere comes and says that why she said the right thing and this image stayed with me. My father was not around much. By the time he would come back home at 12 midnight, we are all asleep, he would leave in the morning, we would see him for some time, Sunday we saw, we are mostly I was raised by my mother. And they had a very good equation. They discussed all our future together, but most of the time I didn't know. But whenever my father was around, this kind of a very decisive idea of what is right, what is wrong, and do it, and there is no hierarchy in life, I somehow, that's because of him. There's no hierarchy in our house. What turned you towards science? You were good in mathematics. Yes. But what turned you? I, yeah, I think the logic of it. I was 
I, I loved maths. Uh, I, I actually love many things. And uh, love music. Yeah, yeah and I, I love literature. It's, I think I inherited from my parents. My mother is also very good at it. And my grandmother was uh, another uh, quite a strong character. I, I liked almost everything. And then uh, history I didn't like, biology I didn't like at that time because it taxed my memory. I had a fantastic memory, people told me, but I didn't like anybody to load. I wanted to load it the way I wanted to. And by the time I hit class nine, I already knew that there are some things that you had to go through in a structured manner. You would not be able to learn physics on your own. But maybe if I tried, I could learn history on my own. Maybe if I tried, I would enjoy literature and music on my own with a little help. But, but learning required physics required intervention yeah, structured of a very it's different a nature. Uh, it's the structure of the, sci uh, the scientific uh, the disciplines that amazed me at, uh, when I was in class nine. Because I realized that, you know, I'm not sure that's the way it's, it's in every discipline is true somewhat. But the way it was built, it th if you did not cross those steps, you would not know and you may be striking to do something that has been done 50 years back. Well, that was not a problem, but I felt that I need to break that and it has to be done in a systematic way. So the logic of it, I was, uh, I loved physics. How, how did you come to learn physics? Uh, in your was, it, was it some teacher who um, was your role model or some yes, elder brother or some? No, it's no, a textbooks. It was only textbooks? Mostly, I mean, we had very good teachers of many subjects. Mathematics, maybe I can still say that, you know, some parts of geometry, for example, I remember one teacher of mine in school, but rest of it was sort of self-tested. Uh, also, the questions that naturally you ask, you know, as a child, you're curious, you're asking questions about everything What kind of questions know. did you ask? Uh, even uh, as a uh, child, well, do you I remember? Every child is a scientist. Yes. That way. Yeah. Because science begins by asking questions. Right. Even if they are absurd questions. Yes. I was, uh, actually I was fascinated by all the gadgets I would see in the house, not too many, but I was fascinated by uh, how, why I was born and when I encountered death, that was a question. Then I was always very concerned as a child, I remember, that the little time you have between birth and death, what am I supposed to do with that and, and are, am I free to use it the way I wanted to? And I troubled my mother a lot with very deep philosophical questions at that time. And rest, I wanted, if I could get a toy, I would open it up and try to figure it out how it worked. Even a simple motor, how is it running and why is it rotating? These things were always at the back of my mind. Uh, my mother used to say that I was smart enough to know how to find the time to do my own things because I'll do what I'm expected to do very quickly. And then I have time to do all my own things. And I never disturbed anybody. I knew what was mine and I restricted myself to those things. And uh, I think there was an encouragement and I was pampered, as you said, as the third child. I was also the youngest amongst all my cousins. We'll continue the discussion. We have to take a small break. Don't go anywhere. इंटरनेट में इन्फॉर्मेशन क्या कभी हवा भी होगी रेशन सोचो की नहीं तो पता कैसे चलेगा विज्ञान प्रसार ताकि हर निर्णय ज्ञान आधारित हो विज्ञान प्रसार ए फिफ्टी इंस्टीट्यूशनल एरिया सेक्टर सिक्सटी टू नो डॉट ई मेल इन्फो एट विज्ञान प्रसाद डॉट जी ओ वी डॉट इन वेबसाइट डब्ल्यू 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 डॉट विज्ञान प्रसाद डॉट जी ओ वी डॉट इन
Welcome back to Scientifically Yours. We are having a fascinating discussion about journey of a woman scientist who has excelled. Professor Ghosh, we were discussing that you started asking question. You were very curious as any child would be, but you were always encouraged by the family. What was the turning point when you came, when you encountered uh, physics and that to physics of that era, which was cutting edge kind of science, which is quantum physics? Yes, um, of course, it was part of our regular curriculum. I mean, at the University of Calcutta, I went to the science college for my masters. But at the time, we are talking about 80s. Yes, it was uh, 1980. Uh, then in science college, most of my classmates were taking their GRE and aiming to go for their PhD in uh, some uh, US university. And because I didn't have anybody in the family to tell me anything, I was not even bothered. I was not that ambitious. I still am not. But whatever came on my way, I always wanted to do. And so I wanted to figure out with how I figured in the market. But you were always very stubborn. That you wanted to do something, you did it. Yes, and I think that may not. Very focused. No, no, it was, I was not focused on myself at all. So it could be my friend's problem that I have to solve <laughs> and then I'll solve it actually. If I have to go for a debate because the principal of the college ordered me so in the middle of my lab, which I should not be missing, I'll go because I was asked to do it and I'll do it well. So uh, it was always like that. I mean, whatever came on my way, if uh, in a very ultra left organization asked me, to draft a leaflet, I would do it because I know I could and I could write at that time in Bengali fairly well. Now I'm, I've lost it. So it is not focused, but if I take on something, uh, that means that I've decided on it and if it's worth doing it, it's worth doing well. You have attended and organized about 165 conferences and workshops. Now if I divided by about 26 years of your research work, then every second month you have been participating in a workshop and presenting a paper. How do you manage that? No, it's it's like, a lot. Yeah, it's not like You've been that. traveling all over the world to attend these conferences. You are invited uh, everywhere. Yeah. No, it's actually not, not that way. I mean, I have not taken part in the organization of all of it, but I am invited. No, but so, you have to write a paper. Yes, so the way in physics it happens that, for example, I've never stopped. I'm doing my work continuously. And then at various stages, people invite you to share your thought processes, even if the, it's not the final product. Right. So my, uh, I... Which is extremely important in science. Yes, so, so The yes. process itself is extremely yes. important. In, and in unless people agree that the process is scientific, and you have followed the steps one, two, right. three, four, right. then you, yeah. it's not science that you are doing. Right. Actually, I have not traveled that much. I mean, six years yeah. I was in the States. And then in 99 onwards, I have uh, picked up a French collaboration. It's only with one group. Uh, the m principal collaborator shifted places, so I've also shifted with that. And that meant basically traveling to Paris maybe once a month, uh, once a year. You've been very often collab collaborating yes, with and these various people institutions visit. in Paris. It's yeah. more than my going. I believe in collaborations in equal terms. So these people visit me and I even have shared students when I am co-supervisor of students abroad. But in conferences, only when I'm invited and I'm paid for, I travel. And uh, I try to maximize uh, that kind of interaction. For example, I have not gone back to the U.S. More, more than once, I think, in, uh, in recent past Canada. Yeah, the story of landing up in U.S. for doing PhD yes. is a good story. Why don't you tell our viewers? Yeah, uh, what happened was, as I was saying, that in master's classes, when my friends were writing all these exams, I was not at all prepared. So just for the sake of it, I went to the U.S. education office and in Calcutta, and I applied for uh, GRE, both subject and aptitude. And by the time I could get a date to appear for TOEFL and all, the deadlines were all over for most big universities. So with my GRE score in hand and no TOEFL, no nothing, I applied to the second rank overall ranking institutes. I was always interested in optics. And Rochester was number one ranked in quantum optics at that time. So I applied and by February 1981, the first offer letter came from Rochester with a pretty heavy assistantship that they offered. And I, at that time, you had to write letters to acknowledge. I wrote a letter back acknowledging the offer, and I didn't say that I would join. 
within two weeks came another letter offering me a Rushley's fellowship, which was on top of my assistant. So somehow they had recognized your value. Yes, I apparently time. my uh, recommendation letters from my teachers were extraordinary. They have never seen anything like that. And then they saw the scores I was always topping. But uh, I was not really interested. And of the five subjects, if I like four, I would be topping in four. And the fifth, I would not do it anything at all. I mean, I was pretty weird. But they somehow recognized that there is something. And at that time, my father uh, took a lead. I was still doing my master's in the University of Calcutta. And he told me that y you should not do something that you would regret later in life. Here is an opportunity. The way things are happening, it looks like it's meant for you. And take it. And he somehow managed the money for me to travel from Calcutta to Rochester, through Delhi and um, Dubai, New York and uh, one way fair in Air India, paid for it. And I was always worried that uh, I didn't want to tax him. And he's the one who actually pushed me to go. And uh, then, of course, everybody aligned to that. First time out of home. And here you land up to work with some Quantum. of the finest scientists in the world. Yes, he was the best. He was the best. And uh, that was also a story I finally, when I got into the lab, and by then, Professor Mandel was old enough. He was not doing any experiments himself. The biggest name in this. Biggest name in this. In it's unfortunate he should have gotten the Nobel yeah. Prize. Yeah. They gave the Nobel Prize in his area after he passed away. But uh, that was a fantastic time. I think in Rochester, that was the best time for quantum optics. We had Bosch and Lom, Xerox, Kodak, everything in uh, Rochester. And then, of course, the University of Rochester Physics Department and Institute of Optics. It was a charged atmosphere. You learn so much from the boss, more from your peers. And we helped each other. It was a fantastic group. And I chose a very, very challenging topic. Which is what is science all about. Yes. The collaboration, yes. the sharing, the sharing of ideas, learning new processes from each other. Right. But my thesis topic became a very difficult one. I chose it. And first draft was actually fighting against my own boss. He didn't believe this, uh, what I was proposing was possible. So we first did the theory of the process. You would see the first theory paper, which is uh, pretty well known now. Uh, I had to do the theory first to convince him. And once he's on your side, he, he's a then genius. No yeah. And then I did the experiment. The experiment took me three years. And uh, I didn't realize the significance of it till I got out of it and when it was first published and how the entire world reacted to uh, the findings. So that's been uh, quite that quite must have <laughs> been a great feeling yes. that you have contributed significantly to science. Uh, I'll have to take a break once again. Uh, don't go anywhere. The discussion continues. You're watching Scientifically Yours. <laughs> इंटरनेट में इन्फॉर्मेशन क्या कभी हवा भी होगी रेशन सोचो की नहीं तो पता कैसे चलेगा विज्ञान प्रसार ताकि हर निर्णय ज्ञान आधारित हो विज्ञान प्रसार ए फिफ्टी इंस्टीट्यूशनल एरिया सेक्टर सिक्सटी टू नो डॉट ई मेल इन्फो एट विज्ञान प्रसाद डॉट जी ओ वी डॉट इन वेबसाइट डब्ल्यू 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 डॉट विज्ञान प्रसाद डॉट जी ओ वी डॉट इन Scientific tempo be the basis for building nation. Welcome back to Scientifically Yours. We are discussing with Professor Ghosh what was the future that she saw 
in quantum physics and uh, quantum optics during 80s, I would like to ask you, the quantum physics begins with probably, um, it has roots earlier, but the father of quantum physics is Heisenberg. And then later on, every big physicist has worked in quantum physics, the area of quantum physics. How do you see uh, this area growing now? Is it saturated? Is it, is it uh, still bubbling with the activities? Uh, will we be able to contribute further in this area or is it saturated? Yes, I think my fascination for optics stems from mainly this, that this is one area where you see the classical world and the quantum world side by side and uh, things become There extreme. is still at loggerheads? Yes, and there is uh, the, the demarcation, the boundary is not known. There are many, many, many unanswered questions. But I'll answer you in one direction that I have taken. I currently I'm working on quantum information processing. Last five six years, uh, 2006 I started, and this is built on principles of quantum mechanics. But the idea is, if it is any good, can we I give a gadget to you that would work on quantum principles? So my experiment started it in 1980s, and now we are going to build hopefully a quantum computer. A uh, computer that would work on algorithms that are quantum mechanical. This is a dream of the future. Quantum teleportation is somewhat happening. And so there are many of these quantum dreams that till in 80s when I was a student, you could even imagine it was like a dream world. We now are seeing that is happening. And when you theoretically know something, my experiment, the significant of that was when I saw it, after that there have been many, many, many successes. Because now you believe that it, you will also see it. It can be done. It can be done. So knowing theoretically and, and then seeing them finally in an experiment are two different things. And that has led to this point. I see a, uh, uh, I mean there is a lot to be done. I see a very bright future of this. And in quantum computers, my feeling is that even if it fails, you know, it would prove something. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would fail. But if it, if it fails, there, there it, it no proves. There are failures in science. Uh, it teaches you. Yes, no, so I mean. You may fail, but science doesn't. No, I mean in terms of principles, because quantum yes. mechanical principles were so difficult to perceive. I mean, you shouldn't your cat being yeah, one extremely example. Extremely counterintuitive. Exactly. Yeah. So, shouldn't your cat, nobody has seen a dead and alive class uh, uh, together. So, if we could think of quantum superposition and make a gadget out of that principle, and it, if it fails, it says something very fundamental about you. Do you also see other areas merging with quantum physics, like uh, yes. maybe biotechnology? Yes, I, yes, and because I because that is also going proceeding very fast towards quantum mechanics. Exactly, I have a. It's not a very uh, nice. The same is the case with nanotechnology. Yes. Do uh, you see some kind? Yes, of I think it's many of these nanoscience techniques you can't do without quantum mechanics. But this is the way. I have a very not so good smelling model of it. It's like an onion model, mm -hmm. you know. Each, okay. each layer of knowledge I right. put in must have the core of knowledge that I already had. So quantum mechanics, if it is a theory for everything, then for classical theory, you do not need to do quantum mechanics of the Earth's orbit around the sun. You would get old and die and you would not solve the problem and you will get the same result anyway as Newtonian mechanics. So for each domain, there is a uh, well-defined now set of rules you know. You have done excellent work. Your work has been recognized by peers and you have received awards, etc., though you have never gone after awards. Uh, did it give you impetus to do better work? No, you need that. We are, uh, it is not so much the, it helps. It, it helps. It also helps to see your students well placed. Since as you mentioned, I am not part of that, that or, uh, organized way of going about recognition. But it helps when I see my students all very well placed. That is my recognition actually. Have you ever uh, encountered any of the situation that I am going to put, uh, it may make you uneasy that being a woman scientist you have faced hurdles just because you are a woman scientist or your students have ever complained that because they were women uh, scientists uh, therefore they were facing problems. This is not so uncommon. I will tell you my way, I mean as I said I was born in a family when there was no hierarchy. Uh, patriarchy maybe yes, but otherwise no hierarchy of power. 
I am from Calcutta till master's students. In your class, your teachers never looked at you like you were a woman or a boy. It was not there. But the moment I landed in the States, uh, people started talking more about me and I often wondered in my mind, I mean I am being very truthful, that is the attention I am getting, is it because I am really that good or is it because it is a specimen from the zoo that is really doing something so uh, extraordinary for a woman. And I went for a post deadline paper in Baltimore, um, this was 80, 87 I think Cleo. And I was videotaped by somebody I mean, I was presenting the paper, okay, this was the, the famous work but uh, before it was published. And I was wondering actually that why I am being videotaped, is it because I was the only one who was videotaped? Mm -hmm. Is it that my work is that fantastic or again because this is a woman scientist is to be put on the pedestal. So sometimes you are noticed that goes in your favour and sometimes it goes against you. Normally women in our society get dehumanised, so are you talking about Yes, I will just tell you, uh, I have been very fortunate in JNU for example, I was the only woman colleague for uh, 18, I think there were 18 of us for a very, very long time and uh, they are good friends. I mean I have been supported by them. Many a times I think male colleagues, they do not realise that it is hurting somebody. That is complete insensitivity yeah, I, but at I one had, level. Yes, and I, I had wonderful colleagues that way, but it was sometimes it is a very, very long journey I and mean, uh, you are alone. Uh, outside it has not been so smooth. So but society is highly discriminatory. Exactly. So women. here in professional fields the discrimination is very subtle. Together. But you have withstood, uh, you have contributed, you have not bothered about this, but you have also contributed towards liberation of women in the country. Would you like to give some kind of message and sign off by giving a message to younger generation? Yes, uh, easier said than done. I think in how, higher education, that is the background of what I am going to say. In higher education, every individual is important. It is not an issue of men versus women. I mean, I see many of my male students, male colleagues under tremendous pressure from the stereotypes. So, you, I, I hate stereotype casting. I think that is the battle. You have to fight from the policy level. I think every individual let him or her flourish and I think that is the way. To youngsters, I have only one message to say, compete only with yourself. Um, I would have loved to continue this discussion. We will be back with another outstanding scientist next week.